So uh, I'll just say a couple of words about how acequias work. Uh, it's a beautiful and simple technology that is very ancient. Um, you start with the river. And I'm going to make life difficult for you because I'm just, I'm not going to be uh, very stable. But I'd, I'll just use my own acequia as an example. The, the presa, the presita, the little dam on the river is someone up, somewhere up here behind this ridge. Uh, it's about a mile and a half above where my little farm is. And you take the water, you dig a ditch, and you make it run the contour. The, the slope of the ditch has to be fast enough so that the water moves without silting up too much, but, but slow enough so that you don't lose any the arable land that you can bring under irrigation. This is a fairly simple little acequia. Um, there are acequias where the, the takeoff from the river source or the creek source is five even 10 or 15 miles above where the farmland really is. So you think about the immense amount of labor that it took to dig a ditch that long through really difficult mountain country in some cases. In some cases, ditches that dump water into the next watershed so that, that can become fertile or so you can run the water down to a plateau. The, the study of how some of those ditches would were were built would be a master class in reading landscape. And the, the people of past generations, the ancianos who did that, uh, achieved some of the most spectacular sort of land tuning um, successes in the history of the Southwest. Really a spectacular, spectacular achievement. So anyhow, you come down and you draw compuertas along the ditch where you want to turn the water out. This is one of my compuertas. It's kind of, it's only about 10 years old and it's kind of new. The old style we could talk about from hollowed and, and uh, really beautifully hand carved logs in many cases. There are not many of those left. They've rotted away. All the ones on my property are gone. But basically, this is a door. The water comes in and you drop a board against these flanges and you pull this little board out and now you have a dam and a side door and the water flushes into the field. There's almost no water in this acequia when the, this photograph was taken, but if it's a full flow, that's a lot of water. And so that comes blasting out and it runs down a subsidiary ditch, which we call a regadera, and, and, uh, and then you cut holes in the side of the regadera and, spread it out on your field. So very, very simple, but hard work and hard to do well. I'm going to actually read a little passage at the end of my remarks that uh, discusses that. So Asekia is really a, a Moorish term, an Arabic term. It comes to southern Spain with the Moors, the Arabs. Uh, and the use of Asekia spread basically all over the Spanish Empire often encountering Native American uses of water for irrigation that is sort of interbred with the uh, acequia system. Here in northern New Mexico, this is the Rio Grande, running down here. Um, here's Santa Fe, that's where we are. And these little spots here, these are open irrigated uh, areas of village life. This is the Taos area, it has a lot of irrigation in there etc. Um, so we have irrigation all through this region. And it's really the core of it. Ah. Um, governance of an acequia is an important contribution of the acequia to the culture of the region. Some people say that the acequia commission, the committee that runs a given acequia, is the oldest, one of the oldest democratic units of government in the history of the Americas. Now, there are a lot of Native American councils and so forth that are fundamentally democratic, so this may be the oldest neo-European unit of government. 
Now, usually an aceque is governed by a commission, maybe three commissioners elected by the parciantes, the members of the aceque community who use the water. Sometimes that voting is done based on how many water rights you control. Sometimes the vote, voting is just one person, one vote. Uh, it varies. We can talk about those models uh, later. But the fact is that you, you have a commission which hires a mayor domo, and the mayor domo administers the water, usually. On my ditch, we don't have a mayor domo. We, we just administer it directly from the commission, which is a little bit unusual. Um, you know, for most, most ditches, operating the ditch is easy when there's plenty of water. And it gets much, much harder when there isn't. When we go into reparto, which is sharing among, among the ditches within our valley, and also sharing among the villages and their ditches within the watershed, things can get really complicated. I'm very happy to say that the ditch to which I belong, the Asequia Bajo del Valle de San Miguel, we just call it Asequia Bajo, um, has, operates really pretty well. There are other ditches, though, where things are constant turmoil. Ojo Sarco, not very far away, people are on the verge of suing each other almost constantly, which um, one of our esteemed water lawyers in the room knows <laughs> well, I'm sure. Um, so it, there's a lot of variance. And there are a lot of ways to talk about a sequias, and one is as a model for self-governance, governance in communities. And also as a model in the Southwest for dealing with shortage sharing. When there's not enough water and we go into reparto, nobody's cut out. It just means everybody has less and we share the shortage more or less equally, or as equally as we can get it worked. That's a lot different from the Anglo tradition of water uh, administration under the doctrine of prior appropriation. The person with the oldest water right gets to use his or her full entitlement, and people with ju junior water rights are completely cut off. So that's a big difference. Maybe we'll talk about it later, but uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it now. Um, that's actually perfect because I'm going to do a series of comparisons between prior and secular law. So. Good. Okay. Right. Um, there's another. Let's see. I've gone behind. There's another way in which secular is our our models, and some of you may recognize this map. This is a map developed by John Wesley Powell back in the late 1900s, and he envisioned a West settled very differently from the West we have today. He envisioned a West that was settled according to watershed commonwealths. And this is a map of the watersheds of the American West, west of the 100th meridian, which was a dividing point for Powell. Well, where did he get his ideas for watershed commonwealths? The model in his mind, there were two models in his mind. One was the Mormon communities of Utah, which had a very strong communal and the other was the Hispanic Asequia communities of northern New Mexico, which had an equally strong uh, communal ethic. And that also had a long tradition of commons, the commons of the land grants. And maybe we'll talk about that. That's an enormous subject, and I'm not going to um, try to get into it right now. Um, There's chairs up front if you want to, if you're happy. Asequias are still in use throughout what was once the Spanish Empire. These are, in a sense, universal uh, institutions, and that's another theme one could pursue with Asequias is their universality. I have seen community irrigation dishes in the depths of the forests of central Laos, and I just returned from a trip into Upper Dolpo, Nepal, and I was surprised, I was really shocked to see Asekis all over the place there. And the most 
intricate hand-worked distribution of water over fields. I just, I looked at this field and I thought, holy smokes, I'm so glad I'm not responsible for that. <laughs> that is so much hard shovel work. <laughs> and imagine if you were on the commission to administer the apportionment of water in this landscape. There's a PhD dissertation for some anthropologists to go into Upper Galpo and learn how this governance is accomplished. And you can see all, this, all these fields are irrigated, by the way, and they grow principally barley. This particular village is at an altitude of just under 13,000 feet, and barley is just about the only uh, thing that, that grows reliably there, along with potatoes. Um, another way to talk about a sake is, is ecological. Um, you can see from this view, see all this, the, tr the leafless trees are cottonwoods. And the cottonwoods are growing basically everywhere that a sequia water, one way or another, touches them. It may be that they grow along the ditch. It may be that they grow in the arroyos where the tailwaters from irrigation drain. It may be that they grow in places where the water has, that it is used in irrigation sinks into the ground and then flows in the water table to where the, the cottonwoods can capture it. But basically what the ditch system does in a valley like this one is to multiply the riparian habitat by factors of goodness knows what, 5, 10, 20, I don't know, a lot. And that creates corridors for animals. It creates habitat diversity. Um, it creates a whole lot more edge effect. So that your, basically, your ecological car carrying capacity goes way up. Something else that happens is that that water soaking in, especially in springtime, retards, effectively, the runoff of the watershed so that it, it depresses the spike in the hydrograph that comes with spring melt. And there are folks down at NMSU, and probably these guys know of other places where, where this stuff is being modeled and quantified, because this is an argument for the perpetuation of flood irrigation up in these high valleys, because it benefits the lower downstream users to have that spike modified and to have a stronger flow through more of the growing season. Um, in certain in instances, uh, irrigation in the spring also mimics the spring flooding of the natural hydrograph. And we see that in the, in the Rio Grande Valley. In the Rio Grande. Admittedly, there are downsides to all the diversion of water for irrigation. Sometimes the native rivers and creeks are depleted. You put the whole river into the diversion. You put the whole creek into the Asakia. That's a problem in some places, and it's been very controversial in New Mexico, where we've got some endangered species issues with the beleaguered silvery minnow that is heavily, heavily impacted by that. To talk about Asakias from the point of view of um, 20th century history, which is pretty interesting. This is a shot of Española, New Mexico, which is just up the road from here. In 1941, when most of it went underwater, in beginning in the late 1900s and on through the early part of the 20th century, the uplands of the Rio Grande watershed were very heavily used. They were logged heavily, including for railroad ties. Uh, they were grazed very heavily. There was a lot of erosion and very spiky runoff that produced big floods in the springtime because the landscape was so denuded. Well, that caused not just flooding, which we see here, but also water logging along and, and aggradation, which is the building up of the riverbed, the increase in elevation of the riverbed through central New Mexico. And 
in response to this, and this is an interesting historical period, there was a lot of discussion about how this should be solved. Because actually, arable land in the middle Rio Grande Valley, fed by Asakis, declined through this historical period. The solution people came up with was to create a conservancy district, which is kind of Asakis on steroids. This involved the creation of the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District, which came about right after World War II. World War II kind of delayed, which seemed an inevitability for a while. Um, in the creation of the MRGCD, somewhere around 70 pre-existing Asakias were condemned. And their lands, were then irrigated off the big canals and ditches that the MRGCD built with federal money. And all those little acequia headings along the Rio Grande were replaced by four big diversions, four major irrigation dams under the control of the MRGCD. There are all kinds of sort of ins and outs and pluses and minuses and lots of dispute that still ride with the MRGCD today, which is one of the uh, most powerful and least supervised units of government in New Mexico today. Well, I don't know if you would agree, David. I agree. That certainly is my feeling. And I've tried to work with the MRGCD and been asked to step outside and get punched out when I did. Anyhow, that's another story. Um, but where commercial agriculture has been relatively weak, where large-scale commercial agriculture has been relatively weak, acequias have remained strong. But there are problems for acequias, plenty of problems. One is, although there are great uh, vegetable farms and, and uh, biodynamic kinds of farms, uh, springing up all around northern New Mexico, the net economic importance of acequias has been declining for a long time. Because people don't rely on them as they once did for the food that goes on the family table for basic subsistence. These days, in my village and all the villages around me, acequias mainly grow a little bit of beef, they grow horses and they grow hay, and some of that hay is sold outside the valley for uh, forage. Um, Devon is from an area where things are done on a much larger scale, uh, and the economics are different there. But in northern New Mexico, a lot of uh, ASIC users are having a hard time, and they're also having a hard time that these ditches take a lot of work. And traditionally, you would have one worker, often the landowner, or a hired peon, a worker, show up for every water right along the ditch in springtime to clean the ditch. And so you'd have this work crew that would work its way all the way up from the bottom of the ditch to the presita at the top. Nobody does that anymore around where I am because we can't find the crews. The young kids, the high school kids, used to be you got a whole bunch of high school seniors who would be hungover kind of uh, after some prom or something like that. And they would be the backbone of the crew that would clean the ditch. Well, these days we can't find <coughs> enough kids or enough young men or enough landowners spry enough to clean the ditch. And this is true in village after village. So we're using contractors more and more, and, and with a lot of regret, because that experience of cleaning the ditch together was very, very important. Um, we have very thirsty cities, and they're going to get more thirsty as time goes on. Um, and those cities are interested in getting water rights from the northern villages, from the Asakas, wherever they may. There are some legal safeguards in place to prevent that, but just bear in mind that if, if all of us are members of an acequia, 
And if just one person or several people sell a water right independently, if they can get away with that legally, that means there are that many less of us to do the maintenance and raise the funds and keep the thing operating well. So it's really important that a sequia is not die the death of a thousand cuts with one little water right after another kind of leaking out of the community. You've got to keep it all together. And of course, this is the biggest and scariest thing of all, climate change. We're looking at the likelihood that the net inflow into our rivers and creeks is going to go down. Some models say 20% by 2015. That's a lot less water for the Asakians. That means a lot more pressure from the cities to get water. That means a lot more conflict at every scale from neighbor to neighbor to community to community to statewide uh, over time. It also means potential destabilization of the watershed where the water for the Asakia comes through forest fire and other kinds of, and, and beetle impacts and, and uh, you know, insect death in the forest. So all those things um, uh, give us plenty to worry about. Um, but I want to return to why Asakias are important. And there are a lot of reasons. We could spend days talking about that. But right now, for me, I'll just tell you, I can't imagine life in my home community, which is called El Valle, about an hour north of here, northeast. I can't imagine life in El Valle without Asakias. Um, the ditch, and we have three ditches in the village. The Asakia Bajo, the Asakia Riva, the Asakia Del Llamo. The operation of those ditches shapes how we live together, how we know each other, um, and how we work together. In fact, this is the key thing. It forces us to know each other and to work together. And there aren't, in a lot of American communities, there aren't those kinds of forces that bring people together in that way. Um, community is not about liking it. But it is about respect, and it's about having a sense of place shared with other people, including a sense of your own place within that sharing, and of being part of a larger organism. In an Asakia community, it becomes public knowledge who is a worker and who is a whiner. <laughs> who thinks he's a lawyer <laughs> at ditch meetings? And who is sensible enough to win the agreement? Yeah is necessary when a problem comes up. You find out who makes excuses when there are jobs to be done, and who actually shows up with tools ready to go. Um, Asakias are an enormous source of pride, I think, in northern New Mexico, um, Asakias. <clears throat> and here's an example. If you've ever driven the high road up to Taos, through one of the most beautiful and oldest of the villages, a place called Las Trampas, you drive along and you see this amazing flume by the side of the road. People stop all the time to take pictures of it. I felt embarrassed the other day because I went to take pictures of it and I thought, but I'm not a tourist. Um, <laughs> but I took these pictures to show you uh, of this thing. This is a very ancient looking structure which brings a sequia water across a deep arroyo. But it's not ancient. I mean, there's been something like this in this place for God knows how long. But the last one brought it out about 15 years ago. And what did the people of Las Trampas do? They went and built the new one the same as the old one, not because it was simpler. It was actually harder to dig out these logs who carves dugout logs these days? I mean, they could have done this with culverts like that, but they were proud of this thing. And it, there's no <laughs> economic playback here. They don't live and die by tourism. It's, it doesn't help them that tourists stop and take pictures of it. No, they love this structure. They were proud of this structure. The structure reminded them of their heritage and their past. So they went to the trouble of building it 
the way it used to be. So I want to leave you with that idea, and I want to talk about the importance of a sekis in just one more way, and I have just enough time to do it. Um, and that is something that I don't think environmentalists and agricultural activists talk about enough. And that's beauty. I've been in environmental affairs all my grown-up years. And I've gotten to know an awful lot of people in the field. And so all the time we talk about our programs in terms of, oh, genetic diversity or um, economic return and costs and benefit and all this kind of stuff. And none of that is why people got into the field. <laughs> and money is certainly not why most farmers get into farming. They get into it because they love the feel of it. They love the beauty of it. They love the experience of it. And so I'm going to finish by reading you a short passage about beauty in irrigation from one of my several best known sellers. Um, <laughs> this is a little book called The Walk. This is the old cover. This is the paperback cover, which is much better. Um, and it's about first water. Now, let me just set this up a little bit. First water is the first water you put on the field in the growing season. And I've talked to other farmers, to other growers, uh, old Hispanic men, young Anglos, it doesn't matter, and everybody has a story about first water. It's an almost religious, it is certainly a sacred experience to put the first water on your field in the year. So I just want to give you, this won't be very long, so I, I promise. Um, when I first learned to irrigate, I was in a hurry to show what a hard worker I was, and flailed more than I knew, attacking the hard ground too soon. Now I wait as water gurgles down the length of the regadera, pushing the inevitable raft of leaves and dead grass before it. It's good to let the water soak and soften the soil before trying to dig. It's good to lean on your shovel, gloved and hatted against the spring chill, and listen to the mutter of water and the periodic squawks of robins. As the water spills from the regadera and spreads down the slope of the field, I begin to hear something more, something midway between the fizz of carbonation and the purr of a cat. It's the sound of the ground drinking releasing minute bubbles from between its grains of loam, and the bubbles pop with the murmur of a thousand sips, a chorus of delicate kisses. The task of irrigation is to apportion water of, along, among the regadera and its capillaries so that they carry water across the roll of the land to every patch of sod served by the compuerta. I use the shovel to open gaps in the side of the regadera so that the water spills out in a volume sized to the amount of land the flow must cover. The idea is to create a smooth sheet of water that creeps steadily down the slope of the field with no need for further adjustment, giving every plant of alfalfa or timothy a deep long drink and reaching the limit of its run more or less simultaneously all along its breadth. That's the ideal. And achieving it is probably rarer than hitting a hole in rot, rot in one or pitching a no-hitter. I wouldn't know. I have never witnessed such a thing. I go about my work chopping notches in the regadera through which the water runs and shoveling out rafts of leaves and dead grass that impede the flow. Where the trampling of animals or the growth of vegetation has compressed the regadera, I dig it wider and deeper. All the while, I listen for the hollow-sounding gurgle of water swirling down a drain. My field is beloved by gophers, and their holes are everywhere. The holes drain off water and leave the downslope sod as dry as jerky. When I find the hole, I dig up the earth around its mouth and stamp the loose earth into the hole to stopper it. 
The dog brings me a stick to throw, which after only a few fetches is gummily floated, coated with drool. Inevitably, he drops it in a swirl of muddy water, which makes the prospect of picking it up even more repellent than usual. This dog, a border collie like other dogs I've had, has never learned his predecessor's trick of moving downhill from where I irrigate and waiting for the gophers to straggle from their flooded tunnels. Those collies would snatch the sodden rodents from the doors of their burrows, molar them briefly to stop their wriggling, and swallow them whole. This collie thinks only about sticks. I dig and chop. I try to tune the regadero, releasing more water here, less there. I throw the repulsive stick. I stamp shut another gopher hole, and another. The first irrigation of the year always demands more work than any other. A winter's worth of debris has accumulated in the regaderas, and the gophers have had free reign for too long. Tractors, the hooves of animals, and the frost heaving of winter have deformed the ditches, and the soil is dry from spring winds and slow to take its drink. Nearly an hour passes. The work is warm. I've taken off my jacket and thrown it to the high side of the <coughs> regadero. Only a little light is left in the day. The set of the water is imperfect, but it is always imperfect. Maybe better next time. I stop and look down the length of the field. While my back was turned, a sheet of water has spread across the field. It glimmers now. It glimmers as it never will again this year, for the grass, as it grows taller, will perforate and obscure it. The sheen of the water captures the blue of the sky, and the sudden red daggers of sunset streak across it. Robins, careful of the dog, swoop down to probe the, da the damp ground. They call to each other, high-pitched and strident. The ground hisses with the sound of drinking, and I hear myself speaking to it, or maybe I only think the words. But what I'm, what I'm saying I have said every year, drink, drink and wake up. Time to begin again. Drink, and we start over, you and me. All that the top of the sun has dropped behind the ridge line. The blue of the sky has dulled, and the sheen of water, now spread across an acre of spring grass, is silver with reflection. It captures the sky in its mirror so that the sky seems to lie on the field, heaven and earth united, but the mirror quivers with the water moving in it like the hide of an impatient beast. The moment slowly shifts. The shadow of the ridge spreads across the field and dims the water sheen, but the cloudless sky remains suffused with light. It is the kind of light you see in the paintings of American luminous. It imbues the things it touches with a kind of purity that holds the darkness of the world at bay. It causes time to pause, and the living things that pause with it hold their breath. Such a light has now shimmered on the watered field, and the sight of its pewter sheen in the stillness of approaching night was proof, yet again, that the payoff of irrigation, far more than harvest, is first water.